Hello and welcome to this week's edition of World Today. I'm Geeta Mohan. Now let's begin with a bonhomie that has rattled the world, particularly the West. Now Russian President Vladimir Putin got a rapturous welcome on his arrival to the North Korean capital of Pyongyang. As both countries pledged and signed a comprehensive partnership agreement to mutually assist each other against any event of aggression by a third country. Flags, banners and posters of the Russian President Vladimir Putin on the streets of North Korean capital of Pyongyang said it all. As the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un hugged Putin, it spoke in volume of the shared values and friendship between both nations. And their bond, as Putin called it, their fight against the imperialist, hegemonistic policies of the US and its satellites. Putin, though isolated by the West, got a rapturous welcome in Pyongyang as children waved balloons and flags and inspected Guard of Honor. But what sealed their bond and gave chills to the West and its allies was a NATO-like comprehensive partnership agreement. This pact has a clause similar to that of NATO's Article 5 and according to Putin, there is a provision for mutual assistance in the event of an aggression. The comprehensive partnership agreement signed today includes, among other, mutual assistance in the event of aggression against one of the parties to this agreement. I have no doubt that this powerful treaty signed between our two countries will be very constructive, prospective, strictly peace-loving and defensive, which will be a driving force to accelerate the creation of a new multinational world free from domination, subjugation, hegemony and unilateral authority. This visit of Putin to North Korea comes days after the G7 summit and also after the Allied forces in Russia's absence gathered to commemorate D-Day event in France. Putin thanked Kim for his unrelenting support for war against Ukraine. We highly appreciate our consistent and unchanging support of the Russian policies, including the Ukrainian direction, meaning our fight against the imperialist hegemonistic policies of the US and its satellites against the Russian Federation. The visit is also seen to ramp up defense manufacturing in North Korea as both countries had a mutual defense pledge. The United States and its allies fear that Russia could provide aid for North Korea's missile and nuclear programs, which are banned by UN Security Council resolutions and have accused Pyongyang of providing ballistic missiles and artillery shells that Russia has used in its war in Ukraine. I draw attention to the statements by the United States and other NATO countries about the delivery of long-range precision weapons, F-16 aircraft and other high-tech weapons and equipments for strikes on Russian territory that blatantly violates the international responsibilities that the Western countries took. North Korea has provided an enormous amount of ammunition. We, we actually we see how they're loading on uh, containers with ammunition uh, on trains uh, um, uh, in North Korea, and they go all the way across the border between North Korea and Russia. It's a small border by the Pacific coast, and, and the trains go all the way to the front line, and they unload, and, uh, and this ammunition goes straight to the front, attacking uh, also the U Ukrainians. Um, um, so, of course, in return, Russia's giving something to North Korea. Though Russia had once backed UN sanctions against North Korea that prevented it from exporting weapons, but in March, Russia, being a permanent member of the UN Security Council, backed to end the mandate of a panel monitoring North Korean sanctions violations. Following the visit, the US and South Korean air forces held air drills on Thursday over South Korea. US AC-130J and South Korean KF-16 jet fighters conducted live fire drills. Putin also visited Hanoi and met Vietnamese President Tholam 
and stressed the need to boost ties with Russia. With Mahashweta Lala, Bureau Report, India Today. It is an event that is going to scare and raise concerns amongst many, but how is it really going to impact the region as also global economy and strategic relations amongst countries? To discuss a little more on this, I'm being joined by Michael Bosakiu, who is a global affairs analyst and senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us here on India Today. Let's begin with the concerns and the impact. Now, how worried should the West be with these travels and visits? Let's first focus on North Korea and then we'll go to uh, Vietnam, uh, South Korea, but particularly how concerned is or should the West be? Well, I, I guess if you have very few friends, as Mr. Putin does, uh, when you go to visit them, it's a big, big deal. So what we're seeing is indeed Russia uh, facing, uh, you know, increasing isolation on the world stage. But however, uh, Mr. Putin is able to travel to certain countries, and one of them is North Korea, which um, it is a relationship that is very codependent because the North Koreans, as you know, are very <clears throat> reliant on Russian oil and gas and uh, space technology, for instance. Well, the Russians, um, it's estimated uh, in 2024, will be paying North Korea $1 billion for artillery shells and also millions for ballistic missiles, ballistic missiles, which, by the way, have come here onto Ukrainian soil. So, um, you know, there is that strategic partnership, uh, which is very vague in its wording, but it has understandably raised alarm bells um, in North Asia in particular. Well, I, I think the West has actually underestimated the threat that North Korea poses. Um, it can be seemingly harmless things like sending balloons with toxic waste over to South Korea, but they also have rocket technology. Um, they are developing technology for rockets that could, for example, uh, in the future struck, strike the, the U.S. West Coast. So um, these are, you know, uh, the Korean, North Korean leader and the Russian leader share one thing in common. They flout international law, they don't care about their own people, and they certainly don't care about their neighbors. So the big worry, of course, we find uh, right now these days in uh, Seoul and in, in Tokyo. And um, I think what's going to happen on the sidelines is the strategic alliance that's been building between South Korea and Japan will strengthen. And also those two countries' alliances with, uh, with the United States, which I think, quite frankly, they've um, ignored for too long the threat in the Pacific and really need to ramp up their presence and activities there. Okay, continuing with the concerns then, how concerned is South Korea? Because this could have major security implications for South Korea. How can they then be, uh, they be looking at this entire situation where the security implications are far too many, given that it's North Korea we're talking about? Yeah, uh, very rattled. Um, I mean, the North Korean leader has uh, basically suspended any progress towards reunification, which is a concern with, with, to the South. Mm -hmm. uh, he's also uh, doing very provocative acts. Uh, and um, this destabilizes the South completely. I think, um, you know, the, the North Korean leader is uh, a bigger threat in the sense that he's very unpredictable. And as I said earlier, he has no respect for rules-based international order. So, um, and, you know, his, his, this visit uh, of Mr. Putin to North Korea was mind-boggling in a sense. You know, we saw, a lot, we saw a lot of show and pageantry, but we darn well know that behind the scenes, people are starving, they're dying. So when you have a leader like that, who doesn't even care about the well-being of their own people, prefers to spend it on luxury items uh, and big shows of pageantry, that's a big concern. The other important aspect, Michael, over here is that a lot of countries want to isolate Russia, but he's not just traveled to North Korea. He's also traveled to Vietnam. So in terms of isolation, here is a country, Vietnam, uh, which is part of the global supply chain. When uh, the West was looking to counter China on global supply chains, uh, they actually looked to Vietnam. And in fact, Apple moved from China to Vietnam, not to India. So while the world is looking at Vietnam as an alternative, you have the Russian president traveling not only to uh, North Korea, but also to Vietnam. Well, look, uh, the Vietnamese and the Russians or Soviets in the day uh, have a strategic military alliance that goes back, that lasted about 25 years. 
And um, the kind of pinnacle of that was Cameron Bay, uh, just north of Ho Chi Minh City. I've been there on the border of that bay when the Russians were there. It's it's quite the impressive installation. But, um, you know, having said that, I think the Vietnamese are very adept at, uh, at uh, exercising a kind of uh, flexible diplomacy. They call it bamboo diplom diplomacy, where they can bend either way, depending where, where, where what the situation is. But at the core of their uh, policy is the four no's, no military alliances, no uh, siding with one country against another, no foreign military bases, hence Cameron Bay is now in Vietnamese hands, and no threats or use of force. So this has allowed um, Vietnam to play off other powers, the United States, China, Russia. But uh, you mentioned the supply chain thing. Um, Vietnam is also a very skilled labor force, uh, relatively cheap uh, operating base, and uh, high quality. So uh, you, I, I was just in Southeast Asia, and you can see all over the growing presence of Vietnam, uh, tourism, for instance. So they're, they're operating uh, very pragmatically. I don't think you're going to see a huge kind of escalation in the relationship with Russia, because at the same time, they also need to keep alliances with other big neighboring countries, for example, China, for example, India. Okay, let's talk about military alliances then. The agreement or the pact that has been signed between Russia and North Korea, quite a significant one over there. It is almost like a NATO alliance where one will come to the rescue of the other. In that, if something should happen uh, for, uh, for North Korea, what are the implications for South Korea? But more importantly, uh, should there be a, a, an aggression from Ukraine, because that's an ongoing war, against Russia, then are we looking at North Korea stepping in as well? Well, I mean, um, the, the wording is quite vague. However, we cannot rule out the possibility that North Korean troops, who uh, have known to be quite suicidal, <laughs> quite frankly, could come to Russia and be deployed to fight on uh, seized Ukrainian soil. This is now a real possibility. And again, we have, the United States has, and Ukraine have reported that North Korean missiles have been fired from Russia towards Ukraine. Um, the serial numbers mm -hmm. and all that have been traced. So I, I don't think um, if North Korea were seriously threatened by the South, for example, or even by China, that Russia would come to its aid. I think its, its friendship has limits too, especially with rogue conmen uh, like the North Korean leader. But um, I, I think uh, North Korea very much appreciates the huge income, as I mentioned at the beginning, that it gets from weapon sales to, to Russia. And also Russia, the, uh, Mr. Putin did mention, I believe, um, uh, cooperation, for example, in space uh, technology. The, so, you know, it could go many, many different ways. I think it's too early to tell, but it is something that we should not underestimate. And that, yes, absolutely, it has implications here in Ukraine because it does open the door to more North Korean involvement in this, in this war. Michael Bosakyu, thank you so much for joining us here on India Today. My pleasure. The unexpected bonhomie between North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and Russian President Vladimir Putin has sparked international interest and speculation about their evolving relationship. Here's a report on Putin-Kim bromance. A warm, gushy welcome. A drive in a park in a swanky luxury limousine drinks and gifts. Sounds like an ideal date, but it is not what you think. This is the bromance of two of the toughest tough guys, isolated by their peers, showing the softies they are. A spectacle for the whole town and Kim ensured they were there to witness it. By some accounts, two of the most ruthless men gifting each other dogs and feeding horses. <laughs> Giving speeches and raising a toast. More reminiscent of a Hollywood movie wedding than a state dinner. Even more dramatic was the warm send-off 
material fit for a thousand memes. The two heavy-handed leaders shook hands and hugged as they said goodbye. Leaving the world in shock and awe. Bearer Report, India Today. As tensions continue to simmer in the South China Sea, the Philippine military chief demanded that China return rifles and equipment seized by the Chinese Coast Guard during a clash at the disputed Second Thomas Shoal in the South China Sea. The incident involved Chinese personnel ramming and boarding two Philippine Navy boats attempting to resupply a Philippine outpost. Chinese forces damaged the boats and seized firearms, navigation equipment and other supplies, injuring Filipino personnel. Friction between both the countries remain an all-time high as the Philippines military released video and photos showing Chinese personnel armed with knives and sticks attacking the Filipino boats. The Philippine military chief, General Romeo Bronner Jr., called the actions piracy and demanded compensation for damages. China blamed the Philippines for the confrontations, stating the Filipino personnel trespassed into the show. 菲方一再聲稱運補的是生活物資。Philippines has repeatedly claimed that it was transporting daily necessities, but in fact, it has been smuggling construction materials and even weapons and ammunition in an attempt to occupy Renai Reef for a long time. China urges the Philippines to immediately stop its infringement and provocative actions. 中方將繼續依法堅決維護自身的主權權益。The U.S. reiterated its defense obligation to the Philippines, a treaty ally. The disputed Second Thomas Shoal, part of the Spratly Islands, is occupied by a small Philippine Navy contingent on the BRP Sierra Madra, a grounded warship. The shoal is less than 200 nautical miles from the Philippine coast. Hostilities between China and the Philippines have escalated since last year, raising fears of a larger conflict involving the U.S. and China. Multiple countries, including Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei and Taiwan, have conflicting claims in the South China Sea. This kind of behavior uh, is provocative, it's reckless, it's unnecessary, and it could lead to misunderstandings and miscalculations uh, that could lead to something uh, much bigger and much more violent. Um, it's imperative that, uh, that the, the rightful legal maritime claims by the Philippines are respected by the PRC and by everybody else for that matter. In February 2023, senior Philippines officials decided to publicize photos of a Chinese military grade laser pointed at a Philippines ship, marking a pivotal shift towards transparency in the South China Sea dispute. This strategy aims to impose reputational cost on Beijing and has garnered international support while deepening the Philippines' military alliance with the United States. The policy, directed by President Ferdinand Marcos Jr., involves civilianizing the dispute and embedding foreign journalists on missions. The Philippines' stance, bolstered by military and diplomatic maneuver, has constrained Beijing's actions but raised risk of Chinese economic retaliation and potential U.S. involvement. China claims Philippine vessels illegally intrude into its waters and accuses Manila of stoking tensions. Incidents such as the ramming of ships and water cannon usage have increased. Philippine officials fear escalation into open hostilities and economic repercussions similar to past custom checks on Philippine exports. Marco seeks a diplomatic resolution while strengthening ties with the US, Japan and other allies. China's response remains reactive, maintaining the disputed status of the shows. As world leaders gather every year at COP to discuss climate challenges, they have indeed failed to reach the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold.
the consequences of the climate catastrophe is being felt worldwide. Heat wave has not only wreaked havoc in Europe and the US, but it has also claimed lives across many countries. Over a thousand pilgrims died from a heat stroke while taking a Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Over thousands of people died and several were treated for heat stroke while performing the annual Muslim Hajj pilgrimage in Mecca amid extreme heat wave in Saudi Arabia. Oh. Around 90 Indians are among those who have died during this year's Hajj pilgrimage, according to sources. Pilgrims were seen using hand fans, umbrellas, to save themselves from the heat wave while they performed Hajj. Hajj is a difficult task, so you have to exert efforts and perform the rituals even in the conditions of heat and crowding. You use an umbrella, drink water and pour it into your body to prevent dehydration and the water sprinklers in the walkways help. Climate scientists state that such deaths offer a glimpse of what is upcoming for the millions of Muslims expected to undertake the Hajj. Uh, we need to prepare, we need to adapt, we need to introduce uh, the adaptation option as much as we can while realizing that it will compromise on the uh, you know, centuries-old ritual, but still we need to save people. But at the same time, we must do climate action to stop the global warming at 1.5 degrees centigrade. At anything beyond that, I mean, we are putting uh, those pilgrims uh, at the uh, risk of death. Hajj officials requested the pilgrims to carry umbrellas and stay hydrated amid the harsh conditions to avoid sunstroke and heat-related illnesses. While the Saudi deployed more than 1,600 army personnel with medical units specifically for heat stroke and 30 rapid response teams. From our risk assessment, we knew that this season going to be very hot. The weather is extremely hot. And even f before pilgrims arrive, we started our campaign by educating everyone about uh, how to protect themselves, how to use umbrellas, how to keep themselves hydrated, how to avoid uh, crowdness, and how to seek help, and where to seek help as well. Hajj is considered as one of the largest mass gatherings of Muslims from across the world. Hajj season changes every year according to the Islamic calendar and this year it fell in June, one of the hottest months in Saudi. With Neha Kumari, Bureau Report, India Today. Actor, singer Diljeet Dasanjh made his debut on the comedian host Jimmy Fallon's show, The Tonight Show. Both shared fun behind-the-scenes clips after an entertaining episode. Take a look at this report. A boy from Jalandhar who aspired to be a singer. Today, from Punjab to Canada, the world grooves on his beats. A singer turned actor, Diljit Dosanjh, was invited to the popular late show, The Jimmy Fallon Show. Please welcome the biggest Punjabi artist on the planet, Diljit Dosanjh. The two stars took to their social media to share fun behind the scenes snippets from the episode. Diljit taught Fallon Punjabi catchphrases. Punjabi aage hoye. Punjabi aage hoye. Jimmy Fallon surprised the singer with custom white gloves adorned with the show's logo. Diljit performed his renowned tracks Goat and Born to Shine on Jimmy Fallon's The Tonight Show. With Americans getting a taste of Diljit's music, fans are sure to ask for more. Bureau Report, India Today. Thank you so much.
Diljit Dosan. That's all in this edition of World Today. Stay tuned to India Today for all the latest news and updates. Goodbye and take care.